Well, welcome back to part five on context. Today, we are going to talk about a verse from Psalm 2. And I got to be honest with you, this one personally breaks my heart a little bit. And it breaks my heart because there is a song uh, that we used to sing based off of, or that at least uses this verse in the song, in the course of the song. And it was one of my favorite songs in my college days. And it was only a few years ago that I caught the context of Psalm 2. And now I can't I can't les- listen to this song anymore without being stressed because it's like, ah, oh, man, ruined the perfectly good song. But Psalm 2, there is a verse that, verse 8, Psalm 2, 8 says this, Ask of me and I will give the nations to you, the nations as your inheritance, and the ends of the earth as your possession. Ask and I will give the nations to you, the ends of the earth as your possession. And it is a verse that gets used a lot. Like I said, it's in one of my favorite Shane and Shane songs. And they write brilliant songs, beautiful songs coming from the scripture most often. But this one, I was just like, dang it, you know. And uh, this verse, Psalm 2.8, gets used all the time in mission organizations. And they'll say, God, we are asking you to give the nations to us. We're asking for you to give the the peoples of the world as our possession. And they kind of use it as an evangelical thing. Like, God, we are praying, we're, we're beseeching you to give us the people of the world. Uh, to to bring them to salvation. We're praying that as we go into these different countries, right? Ask and I'll give the nations to you. And so Psalm 2.8 gets used a lot by mission organizations kind of as their theme verse. God, we want you to give us the nations. We want to go and reach the nations for your name. That is not at all what is happening in Psalm 2. Does that matter? Yes, it matters. If you've been along with us for the last four weeks, then you know that context matters. What God means by the scripture has to matter. And so in Psalm 2, it's it's kind of this conversation about God and his son. It's a beautiful text that foreshadows the, the coming Savior. And it says, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2, says, why do the nations uh, rebel? Why are the countries devising plots that will fail? The kings of the earth form a united front. The rulers collaborate against the Lord and against his anointed king. So the nations are rising up and they're collaborating together against God and against his anointed one, Jesus. The nations are coming together to oppose God and oppose Christ. Verse 3, they say, let's tear off, tear off the shackles they've put on us. Let's free ourselves from their ropes. So they want to be free from God's authority. They want to be free from Christ's authority. The one enthroned, God, in heaven laughs in them. The Lord taunts them. He angrily speaks to them and terrifies them in his rage, saying, I myself have installed my king, Jesus, on Zion, my holy hill. The king says, I will announce the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. This day I have become to you the father. So Christ says, I will speak what the Lord tells me to speak. Verse 8, God says, ask of me and I will give the nations to you, the nations as your heritage and the ends of the earth as your personal property. So this is God speaking to Christ. He says, look, ask and I'll give the nations to you. These are the nations, remember, that are opposed to God and opposed to Jesus. Verse nine, and then you will break them with an iron scepter. You will smash them like a potter's jar. So now you kings of the earth, do what is wise. You rulers of the earth, submit to correction. Serve the Lord in fear. Repent in terror. Give sincere homage to his son. Give, uh, another translation says, kiss the son, kiss the king. Give reverence to Christ, in other words. Otherwise he will be angry with you and you will die. So. The the nations have gathered together uh, and they are opposed to God and they are opposed to Christ and they have rejected his authority. And Christ is coming now before the father and the father goes, look, son, you ask and I'll give the nations to you and you can destroy them. You can you can wipe them out. And then there is an appeal again to the kings of the earth. Look, repent, turn back to God so that you won't be destroyed. Similar to what we saw actually in Habakkuk, right? And Paul's use of that in Acts 13 last week. But the thing that's important to know is ask and I'll give the nations to you isn't ask and I'll give the nations to you so that they would prosper, so that they would be saved. It's ask and I'll give these rebellious kings, the people who have rejected God, who have rejected God's king, Jesus, ask and I'll give them to you and destroy them. And and what it should make us think about is Revelation 19. And in Revelation 19, 11 through 16, in Christ's return, it describes him in splendor and in glory. And his eyes are like torches of fire. His face is as brilliant as the sun. On his head are all the crowns of the kingdoms of the earth. He rides a white horse. He wears a white robe dipped in blood. 
Uh, Upon his thigh is written King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the host of heaven are at his heels. And he has a rod of iron in his right hand and a sword, double-edged sword that comes out of his mouth with which to crush the nations. And specifically in Revelation 19 and 20, what's happening is he is crushing those who have rejected God and Jesus the King. That's what he's doing. Psalm 2 is talking about these last days when all the kings will be gathered together who have opposed God and opposed Jesus and Christ will come and everybody who whose name has not been written in the Lamb's book of life, everyone who has rejected Christ as king, right, the Lord's anointed one, Christ will then come and he will gather the nations together and he'll destroy them all. That's the next part, verses 17 through 24 of Revelation 19. And so Psalm 2, ask and I'll give the nations to you, isn't a blessing for the nations. It's Revelation 19, the whole book, sorry, the whole chapter of Revelation 19, the return of Christ, and then him gathering together the nations who have rejected God and then destroying them. And so we can you imagine, right? Can you imagine somebody thinking through this and going, look, we want our mission trip to be all about God giving us the nations and the people coming to salvation. And we use that text and then we share it with somebody. Hey, our, yay, Psalm 2, 8. This is our salvation text. We're going to go and pray for the nations to meet Jesus. And then the whole Psalm is about these people being gathered together so God can wipe them off of the face of the earth. Like that gets really dark really fast. And, and so does it matter? Like, look, I, yeah, it matters. Uh, context matters. What people say matters. And if what people say matters, then you sure as heck know that what God says matters. And we have to take those things seriously. We have to be careful that what we're doing is that we're reading the text. Uh, I mentioned this last time, and I'll, I'll mention it again, th- that anytime somebody throws around a single verse, go and look at the context of it. Or because probably if you've been in church for any length of time, you've memorized some individual verses. And so take those individual verses and don't let them exist in isolation anymore, but do the due diligence of the research and see what those verses are saying and what the context around those verses is saying. And so think about it, let the scripture be the scripture, and let's be careful readers. And then let's Let's be careful quoters of the scripture and and deliberate in what we say. Tune in next time for our sixth talk on this. I hope that these have been good conversations for you, but also a little bit challenging, and I will talk to you soon. Have a good week.